Good morning, welcome to Breakfast with Naga Manchetti and Charlie State. Now, the family of a Liverpool football fan who died from coronavirus say Atletico Madrid supporters should not have been allowed to travel to last year's Champions League match at Anfield. Richard Mawson died just weeks after attending the game, which took place exactly one year ago. The same day the coronavirus outbreak was declared a global pandemic. Mareed Smith has more. Liverpool and Atletico Madrid have walked out of the Anfield tunnel to an absolutely bouncing Anfield, as you will have heard. This day last year, 3,000 Spanish football fans arrived for Atletico Madrid's match at Anfield. And is it really sensible for fans who couldn't watch their team at home to be able to travel to Liverpool and watch their team play with 50... 1,000 locals? Is that really sensible? The day COVID-19 is declared a pandemic. Got to come to the games when you get the tickets. It's difficult to get tickets, so when you get a ticket, you've got to come. We came off of Dublin and the other three didn't come because of it. And they had tickets, but they just didn't want to take the chance. For Richie Mawson's family, they believe it was the day that led to his death from coronavirus. He loved Liverpool and he loved the European games. He loved them more than anything. So he decided, like thousands of others, to go to the match because the government gave them the OK, everything was fine, which it turns out it wasn't. That game should never have gone ahead um, in hindsight because Spain was in lockdown at the time. Madrid was the worst affected city. It was a disaster waiting to happen. Soon after the match, Richie fell ill. Two weeks later, he was taken to hospital. Through the middle of the night, I just heard him trying to get his breath. No breathe, and I was in the next room. Anyway, run out of bed, jumped out, goes in, and gets an ambulance. And within minutes, that ambulance was there. That was the last time I was seen. Going in the ambulance by himself. And then the next time, two weeks after, put in there all old screen through a video. I'll never, ever, ever get that vision out of my mind. Because you couldn't go to the hospital, you couldn't do nothing, you just, it was a waiting game. Jimmy took on the tough calls to the care team, pushing them to pull Richie through. When they gave me that dreaded call to say, there's nothing else they could do for him. Me as a son, as a proud son, was saying, no, you have to give him another week, you have to give him another two weeks. He's a fighter. Richie died on the 17th of April. Oh, God. It would haunt me to think that he went out of this world with nothing. I couldn't even go to the church, because the churches weren't open. So the, the funeral he got, if, if we had planned it, it would never have been that. Jamie is part of the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice UK group. So now we're in the process of pushing for a, a public inquiry and hopefully we'll get the answers what we deserve. If them supporters weren't there, and obviously they were on public transport, in bars and restaurants, on city tours, I'm 100% convinced he'd have been sitting next to me now. Richie's family will never know exactly where or when he caught the virus, but some who were at Anfield that night say the Spanish fans shouldn't have been there. I remember my mum asking me, you know, do you really want to go tonight? And I was like, of course, it's fine. It's been put on, it must be safe. But when you got in the ground, I, I cannot describe how uneasy it felt. And you weren't just at the home tie, you'd also travelled to Madrid two weeks earlier. It didn't seem a problem and it was weird because there was some times where we were on the plane and someone would cough and you'd make a joke about it and think, oh, what if, what if? It was only when, when I come back, I felt really, really ill. It was a European tie. UEFA, the game's governing body, said it wanted the match to go ahead. But a month later, the City Council commissioned a report into the match. Experts say with hindsight, it shouldn't have happened. Well, the fact that that match went ahead probably contributed to more cases of, of disease. There's, it, that will be very hard to prove. There's some evidence that, that suggests that the cases went up. But, of course, cases were going up everywhere. But back then, there were, there were no lockdowns in this country. So just saying we'll play this game behind closed doors might have led to other problems.
The government says the match took place under the clear health guidance at the time. For the Mawson family, today they remember Richie's last match. Next month, they'll mark the first anniversary of his death. Oh, God. Yeah, it's, it's the face of everything, isn't it? Christmas, birthdays and anniversaries. It's hard. It's really hard. I mean, there's some people out there that's got nobody. They haven't got a voice. Maria Smith, BBC News. Let's talk a little more about the impact possibly that that Liverpool match had on the spread of the virus. Uh, Professor Tim Spector joining us now, epidemiologist from King's College London. Very good morning to you, Professor. Um, I mean, first of all, when you hear firsthand from uh, Richard Mawson's family there, our thoughts, of course, with them and their loss. Can you take us back to how, we, how you work in terms of the evidence? We know those various events took place, in this case, that Liverpool match. Is there a clear and provable link between that moment in time and a spread of the virus? Uh, there's no proof of causality because we're dealing with epidemiology, which is always about associations. Uh, you're getting two episodes in time, one a football match, lots of people, and then uh, a change in the incidence of new cases. So uh, epidemiology is never about proof. It's just about providing uh, evidence that supports a theory and Usually that is the most likely theory, but it, it always falls short of proof. And if you remember at that time, um, back then, there, there was no uh, real testing program in place. There was no early warning program in place. Uh, hospitals weren't recording the data well. And so the only uh, data that was around really uh, of any great note was uh, from our, our app that we started, the, the Zoe uh, King's College app that uh, we started on the 24th of March and started to record cases. Uh, and if you remember, it takes about uh, seven to ten days for cases to, to develop. And, and we noticed that there was a, an increase in the Liverpool area that, would, that corresponded to uh, that game. And we saw similar ones around Cheltenham and similar ones around South Wales, where there'd been other similar sporting events roughly in that time. So there was a, a cause, uh, uh, if you like, an observational association that makes it likely the events were, were linked, but, but certainly not proof because there's lots of other uh, things happening. And we also know that there, were, there was infection already in this country, um, probably from December. So there was, you know, it wasn't, we can't blame it all just on Spanish fans. So I just wonder then, uh, and you make it very clear how, how that works in terms of the, the idea of theories as opposed to proof. What we do know is that as we come out of lockdown, it is perfectly possible there will be major sporting occasions and there may well be big crowds again, along with festivals and other things. So what, what, do we, what can we usefully take from what happened previously and put that into, if you like, what happens next? Because clearly there still will be people in the community who have COVID. Yes, we have to accept just like, you know, there are people every year with uh, flu, despite flu vaccinations uh, and colds, um, we're going to run into them and they, we hope those numbers are going to be small. And currently we think it's, you know, about one in 500 people have have COVID and we hope it's going to be much lower than that. Uh, but yeah, there'll be the odd person. And I think what we now know is that we thought then, or the government thought that it couldn't really spread outdoors, even if you packed people together in a stadium. So they thought, oh, well, uh, you know, evidence from China was that outdoors is fine. We don't have to worry too much about that. That's clearly wrong. If you put enough people in close proximity, um, they're going to be able to spread the virus. So I think we, we've learned that, that outdoors is safer than indoors, but it absolutely doesn't mean that you can't transmit. We know that being very close to people is a problem. And this time, I think uh, there will be better surveillance. We have the capacity to do over a million tests a day now in this country. And I think when these first um, big meetings start happening again, 
the surveillance programme with apps such as ours and the government's own uh, programme now will be much more alert to this and will be actually you know, looking for, for these things uh, in real time rather than after the event. So I think that perhaps also with perhaps testing at the grounds, you know, so you will be able to do randomly test, uh, say, a thousand people and see how many of those actually are positive to get some idea of the likely risks. But hopefully it's, yeah, we're not going to repeat the same mistakes we did back in, in, in March uh, last year when we knew very little about the virus. We treated it a bit like flu and we didn't really... Um, think that the experiences of Spain and Italy, you know, applied to us. And I think we've changed and we now realise that uh, looking at other countries is, you know, really vitally important if uh, moving forward and we don't have all the answers ourselves. Professor Tim Spector, thank you very much for your time this morning. The professor is an epidemiologist at King's College uh, COVID-19 and Symptom Study. That's specifically what he's been looking into. Thank you very much.